Yes. It's fantastic to be here with you today, Holger. I've been really, really looking forward to this conversation. I mean, your work on clarity and creating clarity through visual tools is absolutely groundbreaking. It's um, I mean, you lit up many virtual and real rooms with your brilliance, your insights, your big brain, and you describe yourself beautifully as well as a multi-passionate creative, visual strategist, author, speaker, and trainer, and probably more. And your book, which I have right in front of me and is on your on your wall, um, Creating Clarity, Transform Your Work with the Power of Visual Tools, is a, is a weighty tome, beautifully presented. And the great thing is, when you actually reflect and or flick through it or read through it properly, you can immediately use it, which I think is fantastic. And it's a joy, joy to read. You quote, you say about yourself, you say your passion is to help you see and feel what words cannot express. Now, obviously, this is a podcast today, so we're going to try and do a bit of everything. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm delighted uh, that you're here today, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, David. I'm, I'm really excited to be here, listening for a long time now, and being a guest is an honor. Vielen Dank. Ausgezeichnet. Excellent. But we're going to do it in English, because otherwise my German's not good enough to do, to do anything else. But um. Let's let's just sort of paint the paint the picture, set the scene before we drill into some of the tools and approaches and situations that you play in. Clarity, we all talk about it, we sort of hear it and we sort of know it, but for you personally, why is clarity so important in business? So yeah, I thought about this question before, obviously. And I like out of my experience working with companies big and small, uh, I find that most of our time spent is in clarification about misunderstandings or understanding a problem or trying to align each other and having a lot of meetings about like how could we work better together. It's basically it's all come down to misunderstandings and misalignment, which is in most cases kind of caused by missing clarity. Right? In the moment we have clarity about how do I want to work? How do you want to work? We can agree on our working agreements and guardrails and how we want to work together. If we figure out how I see the strategy of the company and you see the strategy of the company, we can align on this is the way we go. If we only use voice for that, often enough, we misunderstand each other. And sometimes it comes out, sometimes not. And we wonder why we are underperforming. So I think a lot of the struggles that we have is actually caused by missing clarity. And that's why I try to push this, this topic more and more. Fantastic. And you, what a, what a clear answer. I can think back to many a meeting I either participated or even chaired where we thought we're having a great conversation. And frankly, we were having probably five different conversations at the end. It was like, oh, that was great. Was it? Yeah. I'm no, not so sure. True. True. So I have an you, example for this. I, if yeah, you want please, to. please. Yeah. So what I do is when I, when I work with executives, and I know you work with executives too, is I like to, when we talk about the strategy, so my work is in strategy and business model innovation and communication as well. And when I work with executives, I often do an exercise because they all say in the beginning, we are aligned on the company's strategy. We all know where we're going. So what I would do is I, I bring an exercise, which is basically stickers that have icons on it. So a lot of stickers just with basic icons and empty paper. And I give every executive a set of stickers and an, an empty paper. And I ask them, with the stickers, and if you want to draw some icons or want to draw some arrows or write something, you can do that too. Create a picture of the core strategy of the company. Wow, individually. that's brilliant. Don't, don't talk to each <laughs> other, right? So what happens is they all do the exercise 10, 50 minutes. They don't have to fear that they can't draw because it's all stickers. So they, they can just stick them on paper and draw some arrows. And then we place them on the wall like a gallery. And we see six, exec six executives in the room Six different pictures, same strategy. And it's not to blame them or shame them. It's about now we can talk about why do you see it differently than the others and the others see it differently. And you have very specific conversations about the strategy. Whereas when you just talk about it, you feel you are aligned, but you don't know for sure. How do they react when you do an exercise like that? How do they actually react when you give them the, the stickers, the icons? <laughs> like... Some of them say like, ah, I don't do that. It's kind of silly. It's, uh, I don't like, I don't play. I'm here to work. Some of them jump right away into it and say, that's a great exercise. And I found if I frame it in the right way and I say, look, this might feel like play. This might feel creative, but it's a way to really align on the strategy in a way that you can be sure the next millions of dollars that you invest in the future strategy of the company 
will be invested in a, in a good manner and in what you actually all agreed on because I figured you might not think alike in terms of your strategy. So mm. if, I, if you yeah. frame the exercise in the right way, they get, most of them get the graphs. And even those who are a bit hesitant, they have to follow up. If five of them start doing it, the one and only, they have to just follow. That, that prompts a, a recollection of mine where I would never consider myself a visual strategist, although I admire it. And actually, I've done elements of it. Obviously, I'm amateur compared to your brilliant level. But we did a similar exercise with a, with a board of an organization that didn't have alignment. And they were quite quite aggressive when when challenged on the lack of alignment. And so I did an exercise where I basically uh, broke down their strategy into about six different axes with different ends of the spectrum for different, different axes. And I gave them small dots, colored dots, and said, where are you on, uh -huh. on the axes? And they said, this yeah. is ridiculous. And what a waste of time. with a serious <laughs> conversation. And then within about five minutes, <laughs> it was like a polka dot, sort of smorgasbord of things. And I said, should we have a conversation now? They went, Okay, let's start. Yeah. So I should have carried on with clearly more visual work, but you've, you've touched yeah. on it there. Um, you've touched on the benefits and the use, but tell me a little bit more about why you think not only visual, but you talk about multi-sensory approaches really amplify yeah. and strengthen the conversation. Because there may still be some people going, oh, that's fine, but I'm not convinced yet. Go on, convince us, convince us. Okay, I will try to convince you. And I will, I will see if I can manage that. I, can't, I think I can't turn on the other camera, so let's do that on voice now. So when you think of very complex challenges, you have a lot of pieces that are constantly moving, right? You try to understand your employees, your customers, technology, new trends, finances, investments, marketing, then all the challenges and problems between human beings and viability, desirability, feasibility, adaptability, your business model, everything. It's super complex. And even like only those few things that I just said might be even hard to remember just now to like kind of say them again. And that's not even real life. It's just a podcast interview. So most of the things are super complex. And by definition, complex, and sometimes we call them wicked because they are so crazy complex, wicked problems can't be solved alone right? It's very difficult because you only have your only one viewpoint of the thing. You perhaps see just one part of the challenge because you don't understand finances or you don't understand marketing or you're not in the field in the sales department. So you need a lot of people to work on this. And in the moment a lot of people come into this, you have a communication issue because you want to have everybody on the same page. You know, we say that everybody on the same page. And when I come in a company, I literally say, we need to be on the same page. <laughs> yeah, you have you take to. It for, for, you get to a deeper level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what you do is you externalize your thoughts onto a surface and therefore make them tangible, right? By just speaking about it, as well, we only leverage one of the senses that we have, right? When we say multisensory approach, right? We are visual beings, right? A lot of our uh, brain capacity is actually linked to visual input. so. If we just talk, we miss a lot of that capability. And then if we work visually, if, and when I'm saying visually, sometimes it's just notes on sticky notes that we put on or dots like yeah. you did, right, on a surface. Sometimes we draw something. Often enough, we just use templates, pre-prepared templates that we fill out to have like a focus point. But all of that automatically is multisensory because in a lot of cases, we stand. So we feel ourselves in the room way yeah. more than if we would just sit at a table. We smell the paper, the pens, the other people standing around us sometimes too, if we want or not, right? We don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> and But all this adds to the experience. But what it does is, and there is a, a scientific research by somebody called Richard Meyer, who searched for how could we create more creative ideas. And he found that groups who use all, all senses that we have, feeling in the room, tactile, visual, scent, hearing, voice, all that, they have 50% more creative ideas than compared groups who are just working with one input, meaning, for example, just voice, right? Wow. And that's, that's a 50% increase. So in yeah, nowadays yeah, yeah. life, I think that's, that's super huge. important for people. I mean, I can remember, yeah. I can remember sessions that where 
there was just wonderful music in the background. I can also remember visuals on the wall, photographs. I'm not sure they were put up intentionally, but it really, really, really helped. So let's extend that uh, idea. So imagine you were talking with a, a CEO, a C-suite executive, and he yeah. or she was sort of sold on the idea of using visual tools. Perhaps they'd use them themselves. Perhaps they have an artistic background. Yeah. Um, but they're wondering these, you know, the best moments to use them, you know, either the topics or the situations, what would be, what would be your top three where you say you absolutely shouldn't do X or Y or Z without some form of multi-sensory approach? Yeah. So I think the first one we talked about, that's every time you speak with your colleagues or with employees about strategy, transformation, business model, innovation, those kind of broad topics where you very clearly need alignment and which are sometimes a bit difficult to understand if you just talk about them or send like a written notes or send like a bullet, bullet list or something. So you should use visuals for that. And again, when I'm saying visuals, it doesn't mean you have to draw or be an artist. It means that you think about how could I transfer that message in another way? Yes. Would it be like, like a poster that I pre-prepare by somebody else and I just present it? Or would it be like a, instead of a PowerPoint presentation, perhaps a flip chart that I prepare? right? To have more connection when I present to people. So that will be the first thing. Then the second thing is when you basically try to clarify your understanding over a lunch meeting, for example, it could be so powerful if you have like an, a small meeting with one or two other people over, that's why I say lunch meeting it might be other leaders, might be executive colleagues, it might be employees, team, team members, whoever it is, or even customers. If you would have an iPad or a piece of paper, and you just quickly sketch down what you heard. And sketching down again means you could write that down and perhaps draw some arrows in terms of how you saw the connections between the topics. And you just ask like, is that how you meant it? Did I understand that right? And did I get your priorities right? Only that question shows that you are a better listener than most of other people <laughs> and yeah, that you really yeah. care, right? You really care and it helps your understanding. So that will be the second. And the third would be for me, if it's about creating psychological safety, even though it's a kind of a buzzword nowadays, but if you want to really create psychological safety and alignment, I think visuals can really help understanding what do you need to work with me? What do I need to work with you? How fast can you expect, for example, me to answer? What do you need? Like all these kind of things can be very well done with a focus point of a post or a template that helps us yes, discuss that. That's a really good than point. just sitting in front of each other and discussing. Uh, just a lateral thought that came, immediately came to mind, and I'm not sure why. It's interesting, in various therapy sessions, often people are asked to draw, especially children who are traumatized, yeah. asked to draw, as opposed to yeah. if they're more comfortable with drawing rather than speaking. Um, how good do you need to be at, at this? Because a number of people I know, probably me a few years ago, would have said, hey, I've always been rubbish at drawing or visual stuff. Uh, we've got a designer for that, or we hire an expert like you to come in, and we'll do it at a set piece event, like a brainstorming or a workshop or a experience yeah. event a session. Yeah. Is it available to everyone? Can anyone do this? Yeah, absolutely. So if we if we go again back to the categories, right? So if we would say you use a poster that you pre prepare and it has just a question on it, and you use post-it notes to work on that poster, you don't have to have anything in your repertoire than just being able to, to write with a pen on paper. Most of us can do that. And even when it comes to drawing, I won't name anybody here, but a very good friend and actually a mentor of mine is a very successful trainer, keynote speaker, one of the thinkers 50 actually in the top 10. And he, <laughs> he himself says, I can't draw. And I'm like, and I always say he really can't draw. <laughs> And he was doing that all the time in, their, in, her, in his keynote speeches. So he's grabbing an iPad and sketching something. It looks awful, like, like a five-year-old <laughs> drawing, right? <laughs> but everybody who's listening to him is glued to his pen and to his words because it's so much easier to understand the complex challenges and concepts that he's explaining with the visuals, even though they are super ugly, right? And unrefined. They help well, so it? much. Go on. Who is it? I'm trying to think of the top 10. I've just been to the Thinkers 50. I'm trying to remember. Shows my memory. So it's, Go my, on. it's my good friend, Alex Osterwalder. Okay, very good. The designer yeah, yeah. Of yeah he'll love that feedback. Uh, that yeah, will, that will he knows I'm talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> of course he is. Of course he is. 
All right. Um, I mean, yeah. you just to extend that. I mean, we we think of visual, we think of sensory as a sort of art form, but you talk about in your work extensively about it being more scientific than that. And obviously, yes. you 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 practice systems thinking. Many people may have heard that term, but say a little bit more about that and how important it is. So I think one of the big mistakes we do nowadays in companies, especially the bigger they are, the bigger the problem with that is that we try to isolate problems, right? We see like the sales are not the way they go. What could we do to enhance the sales department? The social media reach is not big enough. What could we do to enhance the marketing department, right? People are not, I don't know, not motivated enough. What could we do within the HR department to, to help them getting more motivated? But yes. actually in life, everything is connected, right? Thinking of these things as separate and not connected is just a fantasy, right? Mm. It's everything is connected. It's the motivation is connected to the sales, right? The message you have is connected to sales and marketing as well internally. So everything is connected. If you look down to families, right? You're not just one member for your own, right? You are connected to... Mm your spouse, your partner, if you have kids, to your kids, to everything. So you're always in a system. So actually looking at problems and trying to isolate them, I think that's silly and stupid, right? And often enough, we have those, those big challenges in businesses because we do exactly that. We want to be more efficient, more effective, whatever it is, and we isolate problems and just solve them in an isolated space. And all of a sudden, we unleash them to the world. We see, oh, they're like, this is connected to that and this is not working and this is not working and all of a sudden you have these problems. So that's why I say it's so important to map everything out, like all the elements that are connected to our challenge that we try to solve, understand how these things are connected and influencing each other and then you can find the levers to solve that challenge. Yeah. And that's a great way of bringing people in because, as you say, you might have a perspective on it and you may think you're multidimensional, but actually the finance procurement, the legal person may have a completely different perspective. So it's a great way to bring them in and obviously enhance the quality of the thinking. Let's, yeah. let's keep extending this. I mean, your, your book, which I've been using, advocating, I mean, you have three elements, let's, three elements of the framework. Let's, get, let's give us a summary of that as a teaser for people to go and then obviously buy it and use it. Yeah, so let's try to make it very quick. But so what I found is that no matter which kind of method you use, so some people would live by Scrum or design thinking or business model innovation or Lean Six Sigma, whatever you follow uh, in terms of methodology to solve your challenges and your day-to-day -day job, I figured that there are three steps underlying everything, right? And the one thing that I figured is that we need to start with understand. Right? We need to start understanding the problem first. That might be one of the biggest mistakes that people do trying to solve like a, a problem or a challenge that they didn't define properly. The second thing, the second step, after you really understood the problem that you want to solve is creating a solution for it. That's all the fun stuff where you cre like really create solution and ideas about that. And then the third part is about sharing. Like, how do you share what you have created to other people and then learn from that? So if we would break that down, it's, it's really exploring the problem first, understanding how everything is connected, framing that problem, and then going into creation of solutions, which is ideating a lot and then focusing down your ideas to one, which is always a bit tricky to do. Again, building a prototype or a tangible outcome of your concept or idea and use that to think about how could you design a story flow? How could you present like a pro step by step and getting people along the way? And then how to capture the learnings because you want to repeat that cycle again and again. And that's what I call the clarity framework. It's brilliant. Let's get it even more practical. If you're listening or watching this and thinking, yeah, I want to do more of this. What would be the must have tools or aids that you would recommend whether you're, whether you're using them yourself or not, you think, well, yeah, absolutely, you've got to start with this. What would be on your list? Okay, so that's, that's, of course, the most challenging question ever because I'm a tool addict and I would say we need all the tools. <laughs> and it depends a bit on how specific you want to get. So, but I think very first and very boring, you need post-it notes or statis, right? Electrostatic post-it notes and a pen because I'm going on the nerves of my customers all the time. When I say affinity mapping, just sorting 
your ideas or the challenge on post-it notes and see how they are connected is the first step to success, right? I do that all the time. Uh, you don't stop there, but it always starts with basically sticky notes and, and notes on, on sticky notes. I think that's the first very important one. If we want to d dive down into good pens and stuff, I'm not sure if this is the right place. Yeah, go on, but, go on. <laughs> but you need to, like, I always say, look, what helps you being the best self and what kind of tools help you to feel really good? And that's why I like to have good pens. So I, I would buy pens like the Tombow pens, like Tombow creates mm. beautiful mm. pens yes. uh, that have brush tips and, and felt tips and beautiful colors. You would have Pentel point liners who are really beautiful to write on paper, or you would buy like good moderation markers from like a brand that's called Neuland, but just buy pens that you enjoy using. Yes. And basically what I always have is, I always have at least one, I'm just showing it to the camera, the point liner from Pentel. That's kind of one that I always have in my pocket. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any jeans or any, like, anything without a pen. Always have it at hand. There you because go. Because you, you never know, it, right? There you go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You never know. Because if you have the tools with you, you're more likely to use them. So it's the basic yeah. rule of life, right? <laughs> Everything that is handy to you, you will use. It's like our smartphone. We use it all the time because it's in our pocket. Yeah, uh, and the other you thing you mentioned it. is sort of you know use things you enjoy. I mean, I have a number of notepads, you know, or really yeah. expensive ones. I just like the feel of, probably the smell of yes. now. To, now you now I think about it, and that's where yeah. I, if I'm thinking about a new article or a new idea for a client, I just jot it down, and I find different parts of my brain seem to go into a notepad or then go into my phone on a notebook. But you've got to use things you enjoy and actually think, oh, it's a good experience rather than just a functional one. And we spend a lot of money in other aspects of our business lives. So why not? Why yeah. not here? Yeah. Let me just go back to your, you know, your teaching, because in fact, your new background and you actually, you're a teacher and you, you get exceptional feedback and you're teaching us now without wishing to spare your blushes. What is it that you do that helps you teach people so well and get that feedback and let's you know just take, take a moment and a pause and a deep breath so you don't feel embarrassed but what is what is the skill and the craft that you're using because many of us um have teaching roles whether we use the term or not you could be doing executive education you could be doing it coaching mentoring but yeah. frankly some of us are better presenters and talkers than teachers what do you do? That's a nice way to frame it. And, and thank you. Thank you for the feedback, David. So let me grab my thoughts. Yeah, I think two things are the most important, different things that I do compared to presenters, right? When I'm teaching. The first thing would be keep them up their toes, right? Or on their toes. I'm not sure how you say that properly in English. On your toes, yeah. It, yeah. On their toes, yeah. So what you want to do is when somebody's listening to you and you want them to really take in the knowledge, first of all, you need to create space within your presentation for them to reflect. That might be talking to somebody sitting near them. That might be two minutes writing down the key insights from the last half, half an hour. And it's not about giving them 15 minutes to reflect. It's about giving them two or three minutes to reflect. Yes, really yeah. harsh time constraints, but it helps them focus on the, on the task and they really do it. The second thing is never talk longer than 10 minutes maximum. I mean, a podcast is a different is, is a different environment. But if you are teaching, even if you're doing a keynote speech, I would invite you to just test it out. If you present for 10 minutes and then change either the pace, the way you explain stuff, perhaps you build in a personal story, or even better, you make them do something like discuss with a neighbor or give them exercises that will help them stay focused so much better. And there are, there's research, research actually around this from the book Brain Rules from John Medina. And he said that our brain can only focus for 10 to 12 minutes. Afterwards, it's starting to go into sleep mode, saving energy because it says nothing dangerous will happen here. I can start like, like lowering the energy uh, that right. I have and then not listening anymore. So really, really switch up and then let them do something, right? Let them do something. And what I do here, and that will be the second one, understand your customer and your audience is the same for teaching and keynote speaking. Of course, yes. it's a bit un uncomfortable for some of us. But if you really think about them, you understand, first of all, they don't know what you know. Often enough, when we present or try to teach, we assume everybody knows everything that we know, and we just have to 
to tell them. But often enough, you have to start at a completely different place because they don't know what you know. So speak in natural language, right? Make yourself like connected to them and say, I'm just a human, human being as well. I'm very deep into this topic, but I try to make it like understandable for you. It's yes, very important yeah. to show that at connectedness. And then using different media is very important too, to see what do they need right now. So is it you talking to them without any slides? Or would you use slides at some point for another 10 minutes? Well, what I do a lot is I preparing working materials. So even like last weekend, I was at a keynote speech, uh, n like a hundred people in the room. So what I did is I printed out three templates for every single, for every single participant. So it was 300 templates and I printed out 100 sticker note and like notepads as well. So it was another hundred printouts as well. And they all got them delivered during my keynote speech to do exercises of one, two or three minutes Brilliant. after I teach Brilliant. them something. So it helped them to stay on course, stay motivated, listen all the time. And afterwards, the feedback always is like, I learned so much and I never felt bored or missed anything that you said. They were, and that's in, they were in it as opposed to being talked at. Yes, exactly. One of the things that struck me is that you have a way of expressing yourself, not only verbally as you are today, but also creatively on, on the page with a real sort of style and clarity, which is often rare. How do, you tame, how do you tame your perfectionist tendencies if you have them? That's an assumption. Because, you know, when you're <laughs> oh, doing yeah. design work, it's like, you know, is it good enough? Is, is it finished? How, how do yeah. you know? How do you know when to stop? Oh, man, that's my, that's my weak spot, David. It's, uh, I am a perfectionist by nature, so I would do everything like 150% correct. And I had to learn not to do that. <laughs> Because there is a constraint that's called either time or money. And yes. you have to be aware of that. The but, real world, so, yeah. <laughs> the real world. But there it comes, actually, the answer to your question is, I basically have three scales. So there is a scale for time, there is a scale for money, and there is a scale for quality, right? And they can never be at their outer angle all at the same time. So, for example... It's not possible to create something in just a few minutes for like not much money in highest quality, right? If I don't have a budget for it, sometimes I budget for myself, like my working time for myself. Yes. If I don't have enough budget, not enough time, I can't reach like the highest quality. So if I want to say, I want to create something 100%, I need to ha have either a lot of budget on my hand and then I can do it quickly because I can focus like three days only on that. Or I need to have a lot of time and say, it doesn't matter if it's done in a month or a year, right? I can spend as much time as I want to. And then I'm thinking of like, what is it actually that I want to create in terms of the value? Is it something that's just like a, like a short-term thing, like a blog post or like a LinkedIn post or something? I think 80% is good enough for that, right? The classical 80-20. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I'm writing a book that will be read for 10, 15, 20 years, perhaps. It's kind of something that I want to get close to 100%, right? The best that I can give. And in the moment when I say like, I don't have any idea to, how to make this better, then it's basically done. So I would decide between those two things, like how long will this thing create value? And do I have time, money, or quality in terms yeah, of I the scale? Again, you're design. applying a great structured approach to the way to frame yeah. it. I'm now immediately reflecting on how I don't apply that, but I will do after this <laughs> conversation. Let's delve a little bit more into you, as I do with all guests, I'm going to focus more yeah. on the individual as well as their work. Yeah. And you talked about some books, some people that in, have inspired you. Who else? What do you look for? Who do you look for? And where for inspiration when you're thinking, well, I, already, I, need, I need stimuli? Yeah. Where do you look? So I'm looking for you, David, <laughs> ah, for your uh, podcast. <laughs> very good. Very good. Yeah. Plug, plug, plug. <laughs> I'll pay you later. Yeah. There you go. You get the money for that one. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But no, no honestly, uh, I really enjoy listening to you because you bring on so many different people. So from diverse fields of business, of Thank think, you. ways That's of thinking, intention. right? Conceptual thinking. So what I'm looking into is learning from other people. And I think like one of the things is listening to great podcasts like yours. The other one is uh, reading a lot of books. So I'm buying books constantly i think I'm, I'm reading like at least one or two books a week wow to just wow. 
to just yes. learn, 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 and learn more. And then the biggest part of inspiration for me is always being on site with, with great people. So networking with people, but as well, like being on site with great people. And I would as well, like agree on lower fees for a job. If I know that there are specific people that I would really enjoy to talk to and to ah, learn yes. from, nice right? So nice. sometimes I do that or like last uh, weekend, I was only booked for a keynote, but I stayed like two and a half days because the conference itself was so interesting to me. I learned a ton, right? So as well as I made a lot of uh, great connections too that I can follow up later. So that will be my, my way to learn, like reading books, attending events, right? And as well, like podcasts are like a big thing to me and trying to be, be as diverse as possible. As you're thinking about doing your highest quality work, that dimension, okay. with money and time, everything, just at the top, top of the quadrant, top of the matrix, as it were, <laughs> what, how do you prepare yourself to be in your best, best zone how do you do it? Yeah. Yeah. So I have a few things. So very practical ones. When I, when I try to get in, in the zone, I have basically room spray. So I have organic pine wood uh, room spray and lime spray that I use, um, which gives me that, like that scent. And I have by now like a, like a brain memory and like body memory of that scent to say like, this is, this is on. Right. And I sometimes take that even to workshops. So before people arrive way before people arrive, I would just spray one or two nice. on them and, and get in that. I have a very specific playlist. So I'm using an app that's called Headspace. It's basically a meditation app. And I'm yeah. listening constantly when I'm working to a hip hop, like play, um, 44 minutes hip hop track without lyrics. And that on repeat every day, <laughs> all the time. Wow. And it helps me again. It's kind of brainwashing, but it's it's helping me. F it's helping me focusing. I'm changing it only up when I'm using and when I'm writing for my own pleasure in terms of my fiction writing, fantasy fiction writing, or poetry. Then I would listen to an ocean pier, the waves that are going to an against an ocean pier oh, uh, right. on repeat. So those will be very like very specific things. And then there's one thing I that might be interesting for for the listeners too is is a self affirmation that I do basically every day in the morning. I stand in front of the mirror and I say to myself, I am creative and I'm worth. Wonderful. That's wonderful. And you absolutely are. You absolutely are. I mean, you, you talk openly uh, about autism. Yeah. Your own. You've obviously written a book called The Wrong Planet. It's on your website as a, as a yes. field on your, on your website. Yeah, so I give credit to that because we both have experience with that in terms of my son, your there is the book for people watching. Yeah. Big credit to you for for, the, for raising the topic, being open about it, being open about it yourself. What superpower does it give to you? And what message would you convey to people who are working with or living with people who are either openly or potentially have some form of autistic traits? So let me start with the superpowers. Um, I think one of the things is that I see pattern everywhere. Humans are anyways pattern seeker, but for my autism, it kind of, it's kind of alleviated to another space and, and like, it's super unfair to play anything that's kind of visually connected to pattern seeing, like all the games I will win in a, in a, like in a, in a second, but it helps me to in business, right? Because I see those patterns appear all the time and people say two things to me and already I know like, ah, this is happening. This is happening. Sometimes it's a bit tricky because basically you can set me into a, a normal meeting if they don't know that I'm doing this, right? But you could set, set me into a meeting. I listen for five minutes and I could tell you after five minutes how the conversation will go on for the next 35, 40 minutes. Wow. So because I, I can read people, I can read people so well because I needed to learn everything by cognition, right? Yes. Neurotypical people who don't have autism, they just learn everything like on a gut feeling and emotionally and it just comes to you, right? For me, it's cognition. I look at David and is he raising his eyebrows or not? Is he smiling or not, right? And all that kind of stuff. And I do that with everything. So that's, for example, why I'm such a good teacher because I analyze everything people do and how they react and what they, what works better, what was works worse. And so that's why that's, I would say my superpower comes from that. Before we go into the message, just, just before we go into the message, I want to understand that. How do you, how do you, 
if you do at all, slow yourself down. Because you, imagine you're in that meeting, you know, you've spent your five minutes, you sort of, you got a view and you're probably going to be right. Yet you've got to be patient. You've got to find your moment. How do you deal with yourself to sort of slow yourself down? So one thing is I draw, right? So often enough, I take the role that people put on me anyways, and I take a pen and I draw out what they say already know what they will say, but that makes it easier actually to create those structures on the paper because, right. I mean, I will add, there are always some subtle differences, right? Within people, they are all like, all people are different and you never know 100% for sure what they will say, but the underlying structure will be the same. So I start mapping it out. And then at the end of the meeting, I will have the whole thing mapped out and I say, now that we talked like, I would like to say, now that you had the chance to talk it out, I have the solution that I had after five minutes, but I, w- <laughs> would only, but I would only say in that meeting, now that we talked about it, I listened to you and I think this is the main challenge, isn't it? And then they would say either yes or slightly different, but they would be surprised that I have mapped it out already. And uh, that's how I slow myself down by finding something. If I was one of your clients it. hearing this, and I hope there are clients listening to this, I would want more of that conversation at the end to say, okay, so you've been with us for an hour, hour and a half. What else do you think we'll be doing or thinking about? I would want to squeeze the juice even more. But let's just continue that. I mean, your brain is working incredibly quickly. Um, You're looking for patterns. You're everywhere. How do you manage your energy? It sounds, sounds, uh, if I may be direct, it sounds exhausting. Yeah, it is. And it is exhausting, right? To the surface, it's all all great and good. On on the backside, it's, uh, I have to, like, even when I'm working here in the office, I have to sleep uh, at lunchtime because I'm already out of energy. If I am with clients for two days on site, I basically can't work for another two or three days afterwards because I'm completely blank. And I mean, I'm, I, I'm sharing this of, like, openly as well. I'm, I'm a chronic pain patient as well. So I have a lot of headaches dealing with and trying to deal with that. So it's, it's very stressful and it's not at all easy. And that's why the superpower is a bit of a like double-edged sword as well. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, I have to take care a lot of how I deal with all of that too. It's not easy. Well, I'm, I'm big credit to you for sharing that. And so, what would be your message to people who are working or living around people with autism, whether they're expressing it openly as you are, or they have a have a, hint, a sense and a hint that there are traits? Yeah. I think the most important thing is that we that we are open right, to other worldviews and other ways to do things. Because it's not only autism, there are other like disorders, disabilities, uh, circumstances, like there might be just normal life circumstances. And we should always acknowledge that. Not by saying, I know how it works, but by asking, what do you need so we can work well together? And I think that will be the most important question that people could ask. Fantastic. And last question, and a deeper question. What impact are you looking to have on the world around you? Yeah, it was one of the most difficult questions for basically the, like my whole self-employment. But I think it comes down to, I still want to share my knowledge because I gain so much knowledge by just living. And I'm, I'm just taking in so much knowledge. So I want to share that knowledge because I think it could be helpful. I'm, I want to help people develop ideas how they could use that knowledge. But when it comes down, when you want to boil it down, for me, it's all about better understanding each other and bringing back the common sense, right? Just, just stop like the political discussions, the emo- like the too emotional, the too selfish moves and come back to common sense because if we arrive at that level, I think we can speak on a, on a good level together again and, and develop a brighter future for ourselves. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. That's very moving. And that's a great way to end this conversation. Holger, it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege spending time with you. Thank you for nice coming course. on the show. That was Thank another you. edition of Lanceville on the Line. I do hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Please do check out the other episodes in the series. Sign up to the podcast, the YouTube channel, and you're for feeling particularly generous. Give us a, a wonderful rating. Olga, thank you ever so much again. 